Well, um, natural resources class, here we go. Um, forestry video lecture number two. Um, I'm recording this again after class on Monday. Um, so here we go. We'll just, just to let you know uh, the timing of things. Um, we're going to go to the last page of forestry, which will actually take us just a, a few class periods. I don't think I'll get through it all in this lecture. Um, but we're going to talk about silviculture, silvics and silviculture. Probably not a term that you've heard of. Um, I expect not anyway. But it's so, so a definition is necessary. You can see one there in your notes. It's the practice of establishing and tending a forest. Um, I, I really like that. It, it, it really captures it. It's, it's not the practice of cutting down trees. It's not the practice of planting a, a, a plantation. Um, it, it denotes there's different needs for different forests, and, and to tend it means you're looking at the specific needs of the specific forest that you are uh, given charge over or have an impact on. And so there's a, 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 a diagram that's probably a little bit industrial, but um, captures the general idea. So here you have a period of, uh, of regeneration or reestablishment of a forest. You have a period of time where the trees grow, and that may be may involve intermediate cuttings, thinnings to improve the trees, give them more room, help them grow bigger, stronger, whatever. And then there's a period of, of regeneration when and harvest when you might uh, cut the trees um, and then regenerate the forest and start the whole thing all over again. This is one idea uh, of silviculture, but. But really, there's another, in this part of the country, I've used the term before, northern hardwoods. And um, I think I took that image down now. Yeah, I did. Um, but um, I think I'll leave it down. You, you, you picture that um, stand of, of oak trees, maple trees, ash trees, uh, big ones, small ones, that I've put up on the screen multiple times. In that kind of a situation, we're going to let that forest grow, and we're going to try to keep it looking I better pull that picture up. We're going to try to keep it looking like that in perpetuity. I mean, for just as long as we can uh, can um, uh, keep it going. And so um, this is the picture that I'm I'm fumbling for, uh, if it will actually open up um, here. And so here we we would not cut this all down, clear cut it. And then, you know, try to plant a whole bunch of new trees and then wait for them to grow up. In this situation, we would um, harvest certain trees, certain species, usually certain sized trees as they got older or crowded or diseased or just mature, whatever. But we would try to keep a forest on the landscape. And we would try to keep it a diverse forest, not just one species, but multiple species, multiple size classes, little stuff, big stuff, everything in between. And, um, and, and so that would, would, would give us a little bit different look than this, but we would still be tending the forest, just trying to keep that forest growing and, and producing um, uh, forest products uh, of a variety of sorts. And those might uh, might include lumber and pulpwood and things of that sort. They might also include uh, um, aesthetics. They might include might include sap from maple trees. They might include um, uh, whatever fruits or nuts we might want to uh, uh, gather from the forest floor that grows there. Uh, whatever the hunting of the animals that live there. Whatever taking pictures of them. Um, all those are are values. Uh, goods and goods that if you will that that forest can. Uh, can produce, and so, um, but it, but usually silviculture does involve some kind of harvest, and so um, we want to think about why we might want to cut. I'll show you some pictures here. I, I like this picture. It uh, it it brings to mind Fangorn Forest from Lord of the Rings, if you will. It's almost as if this tree had legs, and uh, this really uh, this really tells much of what went on in this area. This is an old pine stump, and it was cut off, uh, harvested back you know, probably uh, early 1900s, late 1800s. And so you can picture this pine stump there. And this is a yellow birch. And along comes this yellow birch seed, settles in the top of that uh, pine stump, and, uh, and it grows. And it takes root in the pine stump and sends its roots down through the pine stump into the ground. Well, the pine stump begins to decay around it, and uh, it'll leave that tree actually suspended above the ground. I've actually seen these things uh, four or five feet off the ground. with uh, You could walk underneath them. Uh, sometimes and again, really just tells you what's what's gone on there in the past. There was harvest there in the past, 
but but some reasons that you might want to harvest some trees if we go down a little farther um, here um, there's been uh, some blowdown some trees were, were knocked down these all the way down this one leaning over and so you might want to capture some of the value uh, in those trees before uh, it's lost to decay um, this is a, a, a stand of predominantly sugar maples and and so maybe you want to go in here and you want to uh, thin it out maybe it's too thick so that they're not growing as vigorously as you'd like or or maybe there's some disease you can see a broken one here um, and you want to harvest that out and uh, and, and to, to maintain that stand that that might be another reason that you might uh, choose to harvest some some trees um, in a case like this you might want to uh, this this landowner wanted to harvest some trees uh, for money to pay property taxes um, and that's that's a legitimate reason for sure um, and uh, here's here's a, an example of another reason there's a disease in there this is Utapella canker I mentioned that the other day and this is in a maple tree but uh, that tree will will break off there pretty quickly and so why not to harvest it and capture some of the value of it so those just some reasons uh, that I have listed here that you might want to um, uh, harvest some trees um, we want to look just specifically because uh, there's some neat stories at uh, some of the, the stories the the, the diseases um, um, have us remember and the first one I'm going to mention is white pine blister rust now this is uh, I choose this one first because it was the white pine that was pre predominantly sought after um, in the original pine lumbering era and uh, white pine is still a very a very uh, popular uh, landscape tree um, you can see a very long soft needles on on a white pine tree uh, very popular tree I'm gonna move that back over there I'm gonna need that for a second but um, uh, it was so popular in the early, late 1800s early 1900s it was um, uh, exported seedling or the tree was exported to both uh, Asia Japan specifically and to Europe and uh, and there it was propagated and we didn't have a big nursery industry in our country back then so uh, there was in in Asia and in Europe both they figured out how to grow little trees and so they did that and shipped some back into our country well when they brought it back into our country unfortunately along with those little seedlings came um, uh, a fungus the fungus specifically was um, uh, white pine blister rust. Now this is a mature white pine tree. Look at that thing, just tall and uh, beautiful tree. But oftentimes you'll see white pine trees around here with a dead top. And that's very typical of white pine blister rust. And what, uh, what also you'll see if you look a little closer on some smaller trees is this, we call this flagging, where the fungus has actually penetrated these needles uh, and typically very typically it is ones towards the ground and uh, the fungus then will work its way along the stem until it gets to the trunk of the tree and if you uh, if you uh, cut this limb off close to the stem um, you would prevent the stem from getting affected by that uh, that fungus but typically people don't and so it gets to the stem of the tree and when it does that usually it's too late here's some fruiting bodies of uh, white pine blister rust and uh, it's actually affecting that stem I got to move me out of the way here a little bit um, and uh, oops and uh, when allowed to uh, continue um, what's going on here it's it's basically a vascular wilt it's it's plugging the vascular tissues of uh, of the tree the ones we talked about the xylem the phloem, and the cambium and the tree uh, can't live so um, this might be the blister rust canker up here where it first infected it and so that portion of the tree above that died and so the, the tree tried to reestablish that 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 crown that that terminal growing portion and a number of these limbs start to get bigger and grow upwards but but it's a battle and the fungus continues to grow down and it's called blister rust because there are these blisters on it and they'll just ooze pitch all over the place come to find out that the intermediate host is the gooseberry or current species of plants here are gooseberries they grow wild in uh, just north of here in the woods and they're a, a good fruit they're good to eat and uh, you can make gooseberry pie these are currants you'll see them in a very popular landscape tree but what happens is the fungus will um, 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 start out on an infected tree um, it has an intermediate host and it has to go from that infected tree to its intermediate host the gooseberry and uh, it lives for a while there without really affecting the gooseberry and then it will go back and reinfect other white pine trees and um, and and spread the fungus that way 
So if you look, a lot of that is summarized right here. The fungus invades the phloem and the cambium. So the phloem is what uh, moves photosynthates, sugars, around in the tree. And the cambium, um, that gives rise to new xylem and phloem. So it's just inside the bark this is. And it girdles the tree. So it kills cells in a ring around the tree. And, uh, yep, Asian origin also, um, also came from... Um, from Europe, but was reimported in 1908, and yeah. Now, when you remember that we're, we're at that time really wanting the white pine to reestablish itself, since we cut most of them down in the woods around here. Along comes its fungus and really throws a wrench in the works. So what happens? Well, foresters decide we're going to we're going to eradicate that disease by eliminating the intermediate host. And so there would be these crews of high school students, largely looking for a summer job. And their job was to go around the woods and tear up gooseberry plants. And uh, the way they kept track of how much they got paid is they would have a little clicker like you would keep for your golf score. And every time they pull up a gooseberry plant, they'd click the clicker. And, uh, and through the woods they would go. And that's kind of a problem because they're decimating kind of a nice species, the gooseberry. But it wasn't very long before the students, some of them, figured out that all they had to do was walk through the woods, not pick up any gooseberry plants, and just hit that clicker. And the more times they hit that clicker, the more they got paid. And it was an abject failure, which is kind of good, because I like goose gooseberries anyway. But, goose, but, but blood, blister rust it remains, to this day, a significant problem. And um, I'll I'm, I'm talk about this when we get out to... Um, go outside to do a little walk, one of the things you can do if you have this kind of a tree in a landscape setting is to uh, remove the lower 40% of the limbs. So get those limbs up higher. Uh, gooseberry and currants are a low-lying shrub and uh, you're less likely to get um, the fungus into a white pine tree if you remove those lower limbs early on. And then also just checking for those flags and cutting those limbs off in hopes of catching the fungus before it gets into the tree. So that's white pine blister rust, and I think I can still show you an example of that up where we're doing maple syrup. So we'll move on to the next one, which is Dutch elm disease. Uh, Dutch elm disease, wow. This is a disease of um, American elm. And uh, this is what boulevards in uh, the Twin Cities used to look like in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. This looks like into the 70s, if I remember right. And pretty about, about in there, it actually started in the 30s out east. And, um, well, I'll just tell you the story. So um, oh, even though we grow wonderful elm in this country, it was decided to import an elm tree from, um, from England that had been infected by Dutch elm disease from the Netherlands. And uh, it was probably originally a disease uh, from Asia, if you track it back. But we got that elm log from England, and it was infected from, from Holland, from the Netherlands, hence the name Dutch. Um, and so they imported it, uh, shipped it over here, offloaded it in Boston Harbor, I believe, loaded it on a rail car, and sent it west uh, to Ohio. And all along the way, beetles jumped off that log, and each of the, each time it did, those beetles uh, became a um, infection site for the spread of Dutch elm disease, and it it became an absolute epidemic. And if you look, this this is a boulevard. Just a few years later, this is that same boulevard, utterly devoid of trees. Uh, there's one lingering elm here, and I'm pretty sure it's probably not still there. Just as a side note, a number of these trees that they planted along that boulevard to replace the elm trees were green ash trees, <laughs> which are affected by emerald ash borer now. So from that to that, pretty epic change. The beasties involved are the European elm bark beetle and the native elm bark beetle. Uh, now, they feed on these trees here. If there's a hailstorm comes through or you prune them or something like that, they're more likely to come feed on the sap. Uh, the problem is they'll have the spores of the particular um, um, pathogen, the Dutch elm disease, on their backs, and then will spread it to the new tree. Um, the um, European elm bark beetle will leave these canals right here. Here's, here's the adult going down laying eggs on this canal here and then radiating out from it are the little uh, larvae that hatch out and you notice these canals get bigger as they migrate as migrate away from that central canal and and really what they're doing is they're they're going to girdle 
um, that tree, but they're spreading the fungus uh, as as they do that. Okay, so it's not the girdling of the tree by the bug that really um, is the problem. It's the spreading of the fungus. The tree could survive the insects, but not the fungus. And our, our native elm bark beetle lays canals that go the op 90 degrees opposed to that. And I've got uh, examples of that that uh, you can see in class if you want to look at them. So you can see here is the European elm bark beetle. Here's the native elm bark beetle, but you probably can see that better on the picture anyway. Um, here's the size of those beetles compared to a dime. They're not big. Uh, this also, though, is a vascular wilt. We call it a vascular wilt. Va remember, vascular tissue, xylem phloem cambium. And so um, this particular fungus plugs the xylem. Now, in the previous one, it was phloem and cambium that was plugged, but here it's the xylem. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's called a vascular wilt because the tree basically can't pump water up and it wilts. Let's see if I can pull this down. Yeah, like so. These trees are, the leaves are drying up. Once, once, you, once you see this, that tree is not recoverable. It, it's going to die, unfortunately. Um, it is also spread by what's called common root graft. And so... If we look here, I don't know if I'm going to move me out of the way again here. I don't know if I have a picture of a, of a root graft. I don't. I'm going to show you an example of it than I do in the next one, I think. So here's a root graft. This is actually a branch graft, but it would look the same in roots. You'll see the picture in a minute here. And the trees actually, the, the, in this case, the limbs rubbed on each other, exposed some of that cambium. Uh, they act, actually caused them to grow together, and now they're a... They're, they're merged together. We call that a graft. But that is Dutch elm disease. The last one that I have listed here is oak wilt. And uh, this is a common disease of um, this part of the country. And it is also a vascular wilt. And this is an oak tree now. And you can see the leaves going brown, dying on it when those around it are green. So you no, it's not fall of the year. This is a native fungus. This is not one that we imported from Asia or anywhere else. It's always been a, a feature or it's developed as a feature of our own continent. And so if we just look at the notes here, plugs, it's a fungus that plugs the xylem, uh, kills red oaks quicker than white oaks. White oaks are more resistant. In the structure of the cell structure of oaks, uh, if you remember, um, uh, let's see here. It's, it's okay to think of, uh, of a tree as, as really a tube. Those tracheids, libriform fibers, all the xylem cells are long tubes. And um, um, in, those, in, in oaks, red oaks, there's a little flapper valve that can close on those tubes. It's called a tylosis. And in red oaks, it's not complete. It won't completely shut it. But in white oaks, it will. And so it's probably that feature that makes this fungus spread more slowly in a white oak, make, make the white oak potentially more able to um, fight off the disease than, than the red oak. So it's, it's, a, it's plugging the xylem again, like Dutch elm disease, um, and it's spread by root craft and by another beetle. And um, I'll see if I can show you those particular problems. Okay, here's a root graft, and you can see um, the trees have grown together, and the problem is really, um, from this picture here, we can see the affected tree right here. In the ground underneath it, because it's so close to these other trees, the roots will actually be growing together and grafting. And so if uh, this is your yard situation, if this just begins to show problems, uh, you can actually go in with a root disruptor and break that root union between those two trees and then remove this di diseased one, and you might actually keep it from affecting uh, the trees around it. But that's a root graft. The picnic beetle will, will spread, spread it just like with... Um, um, the uh, Dutch elm disease and uh, carrying the spores on its back. And so what happens? Well, um, underneath the bark, as the fungus spreads, making that sort of diamond pattern, it will um, plug the xylem, but then it's thinking, uh, you know, it wants to, it wants to reproduce and so um, it, and spread. And so it's going to produce these uh, pressure pads under the bark that will cause the bark to pop um, out away from the stem. 
like you see here. And uh, it, these, this fungus will actually exude a sweet fragrance that attack, attracts uh, the insect, the picnic beetle, to it. And it will feed on that area and um, uh, get the fungus on its back, go to another uh, oak tree and um, um, spread the fungus that way. Picnic beetle doing that. Or by root craft. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why you never, never, never prune an oak tree. I would say from April um, through July, they say, I, I would go even into August. Here's a good rule of thumb. Don't prune a tree, unless you're cutting just dead wood off. That's okay. You can do it anytime. But don't prune a tree when it's uh, actively growing. Do it in the winter time. If you prune your oak tree and it gets oak wilt, because you've attracted, you've made a wound on the tree and attracted the picnic beetle. And then it can be shown that that oak will then spread to your neighbor's tree. Uh, you can be liable. Uh, your neighbor can sue you for damages. And this can be tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, that I'm not talking could be. I'm talking these are court cases that have been settled in the metro area. Uh, if it can be shown that you caused a damage that attracted the, the uh, oak wilt to, to your neighbor's property and uh, you become liable. So it's, it's a big deal. You don't want to mess with, with these if you can help it. Um, just to show you um, sort of the progression of this disease, it's, it's a big deal. Um, this is what it looked like in 2010. Um, notice this area right here, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, northern Michigan. Okay, and then if we go down just, so that's 2010. If we go down, this is 2018. Okay, these red areas are, are new damage. And that's how rapidly it's spreading in those areas. It used to be that we didn't have to worry about it in northern the northern tier of states, northern tier of the lake states, but now we do. You can't cut, you better not cut a live oak tree uh, during the summer uh, in this part of the, of the country. You just don't want to be anywhere have anything to do with that. All right, that's oak wilt. We're, um, I just wanted to show you real quickly another um, um, disease that really has affected um, our country, and that is chestnut blight. Not going not gonna to put this in the notes or anything, but just as an aside, uh, it's a pretty pretty incredible thing. Chestnut trees used to be the dominant tree in eastern forests. Um, they are a look at the flowers that they produce. Uh, just beautiful trees and not only that but they produce an edible nut. Um, you remember the Nat King Cole uh, Christmas Carol chestnuts roasting on an open fire and well there you have it. You don't want to eat a red, red oak acorn. They're bitter but if you eat a chestnut or roast them and eat them they're very good to eat. I'm told I've never had one. There was one remaining stand in Wisconsin, um, and there were three landowners that owned it, predominantly one landowner, and uh, they did great, expended great effort try to keep the fungus away. They would use fungicides around the perimeter of this stand and did so successfully for years, but unfortunately, chestnut has, the, that stand has been invaded by, um, by the fungus, the chestnut blight, and now... Uh, this is what chestnut lumber looks like. It is just beautiful. You can, this is chestnut veneer. You see there's, there's uh, uh, slices of it have been cut off. They're trying to make the most of it. You would pay a lot of money for that, that lumber, but it's, it, is, it is now available, uh, but uh, for a limited time because um, they just don't uh, uh, regrow well. They're very resistant to rot, beautiful lumber, tall, straight trees. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a sad tale. Hopefully we can genetically modify chestnut to resist that, that fungus and have them available again in the future. I think I'm coming pretty close to the end. I would like to just cover a, uh, a couple of insect diseases quick here. Emerald ash borer being one of them because it's a very important one um, in, uh, currently in our world. So we have the ash tree. Uh, green ash, black ash, white ash, doesn't matter, affects them all. Um, when those trees are bigger than an inch and on up, that's when the insect seems to prefer them, and it, uh, it does this to them. Um, it's not the adult that does the damage, it's the larva. The adult comes along, so these are the different kinds of ash, kinds of leaves. Green ash is most predominant. There's the beetle that does the, the, the dirty work, if you will. Um, emerald in color, okay, and so 
it, it'll make a D-shaped cap, uh, a hole in the bark of an ash tree. They're not always D-shaped, though. If you see that, you know you've got it. But if you've got holes in your bark, you, you might have it still. It's, it's not always. It's not like it. It's it's really geometrically um, uh, specific that way. But this is the problem: is the larvae get in underneath the bark, they're chewing away at the cambium, and and they kill the cambium. And the emerald ash borer is supposed to be stopped by temperatures more than 20 below zero. But now we can see where it's spread to. We can see that that's not the case. It doesn't seem to be stopping it. Maybe it'll slow it down. I don't know. Um, but, yeah. The main thing that you're seeing, and this year we're seeing it all over the city. Saw it last summer, seen it this summer. This is what's called blonding on an ash tree. That tree is going to die. And basically you've got an insect coming along and, and boring into the tree. And then a woodpecker coming along trying to eat the insect. Knocks all the bark off the tree and makes that kind of a look. Uh, that tree is not going to survive uh, that kind of activity, unfortunately. And so emerald ash borer, oops, wrong one, was a disease that was brought into our country um, um, on uh, in packing, in packing wood material into Detroit, Michigan in, from China in 2002. Um, and and uh, so not that long ago, and it's just decimating uh, all through the Midwest, really decimating green ash predominantly, but white ash, black ash. As a forester, we're encouraged not to even manage for um, ash anymore because they're basically giving up on it, uh, which bothers me. We've given up on elm trees. We're giving up on ash trees now. We've given up on butternut trees. Pretty soon we're going to have nothing but toothpicks out there. So I think we'll, hopefully we'll figure out some way to deal with this. The last one is the gypsy moth. And the gypsy moth... Uh, looks like this. This would be the, the female. This would be the male. The female was flightless. Um, only the male could, uh, could, could move around. Um, but now they're finding what looks like flighted females, which is kind of a worry. means that the disease can, the, the, the disease, the insect can spread more readily. Uh, when my kids were little, we went to Kansas and my daughter, the interest in, um, insects captured a bunch of pretty moths. Didn't pay attention to them. She put some foliage in a jar on a stick, sealed it up. We brought it back to Minnesota. She was showing me what she brought. And I looked at it, and I got a kind of a cold sweat came over me. And this is what I was looking at. And I had recognized it immediately. Uh, it sprung a uh, yeah, memory, and I looked it up. And sure enough, my daughter had brought a gypsy moth to Minnesota, which at the time was not infected by gypsy moths back to, to Minnesota from Kansas. I, I, I'm a forester and I was spreading uh, gypsy moth. Well, needless to say, we didn't open the jar. <laughs> um, this is what they can do. Look at the egg mass that a female can lay. And like I say, now they're believed to be flighted, which means they can spread farther. These are gypsy moths crawling up a tree. And uh, this is the damage that they will do. Um, defoliating a tree. They don't kill the tree necessarily uh, when it's defoliated. Of course, they knock it back. And here you can see what a defoliation looks like. This is probably New England. These caterpillars were brought to the United States intentionally by an entomologist, somebody that should have known better. It was looking, he was looking for an insect that would make silk better in cold climates. So he brought it intentionally here. Oh boy, that guy. I'd be interested to see his gravestone. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, and so and now it's it's a major defoliator. If you've ever seen the little uh, gypsy moth testing tents, um, I'll see if I can pull one up here real quick. I don't know if that's going to get it, but um, we'll see what it'll do. Uh, you'll see them. Um, there's different. It's just going to give me gypsy moth. I'm afraid. Uh, they're basically pheromone traps. That's what I should have put up as a pheromone trap. Um, that are spread around. Actually, you can get a summertime job. There we go. Well, this is one look at them. Usually they're little triangular tents, depending on what they're testing for. And uh, you can get a summertime job going around checking uh, uh, gypsy moth traps and, and other kinds of traps. But uh, um, going around check checking those traps and seeing if uh, there's any uh, insects of that sort attracted to that particular trap. So these are all showing up uh, like that green one right there. And uh, have yourself a good summertime job. All right.
So this last line here, compartmentalization, that's already a line that's in your notes from um, when we did xylem phloem, that kind of a thing. We talked about walling off, so that's already there. So we'll start with um, how much to cut um, when uh, you come back from spring break. You have a good day. Thank you very much.